Thank you for uh, attending to the uh, uh, 1917 Einstein paper uh, about uh, the modification of Newtonian gravity. May I suggest that you uh, supplement your picture of Einstein with pictures of uh, Seliger and Neumann from the 1890s, who did much of that, and with the many fathers of the Klein-Gordon equation, because in retrospect, what that is is a graviton mass. It's really not a cosmological constant. Cosmological constant is zeroth order dominated, and yours is first order. So uh, that's I'm just. Right. But, uh, what mistake you? Ah, right, right, yeah, yeah. I right, yeah, what, what works is the first order, but that's not analogous to the right, cosmological right. constant. That's, right. that's the point. Right. Otherwise, it's a graviton mm. mass that solves the problem. Okay, well, thank you for that. Okay. Yeah. Um, something which could have been done by Gauss and Riemann, and I don't think was done, which gets rid of some of the problems you're talking about, is to do Newtonian um, gravity on a curved three space. And th then you can get a halfway house between GR and Newtonian theory. Um, but which problems have I not got rid of that that gets rid of? Well, in that case, space isn't homogeneous. They, there are preferred places in space. It's no longer a homogeneous space section. Yeah, I mean, I don't think any of these arguments really depend on exact homogeneity. So, so you say space-time structure is not directly observable. It is observable if it's inhomogeneous. Oh, I see. And from that point of view, sure, sure, yeah. <coughs> In the Parson equation, you could take grad square to say a Lobachevsky space. Yeah, and then you have a curved space in Newtonian gravity. But you can do a Schwarzschild like thing where the yeah. thing is curved as you go. I mean, I mean, if Lobachevsky is still homogeneous, still yeah. isotropic. But you could pick any space. Right. <laughs> Many, many, many thanks for that. A, a superb talk. I'm um, just on a minor historical, uh, a minor historical question. Um, f many thanks for the note from the, the system of the world, and it is very revealing. But uh, I mean, of course, it doesn't offer any explanation as to why these external forces would exactly balance. And um, I notice in sort of, you know, very po sort of simple, popular level biographies of Newton, they always put emphasis on that on that phrase you made. You know, a creative act of enormous precision. Is, is it possible there's a slight, in, in his own mind, there's a slight theological argument that simply the whole thing of, you know, is a creative act of enormous precision any less likely than a creative act of, of not such precision, et cetera, et cetera? Was that possibly the get-out clause, or is that, is that a silly argument? Um, well, I, I think that... Um, <laughs> I, th I think enormous precision, in a sense, doesn't help. Um, I, I think it's... Uh, th 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 the, the, the precision, the precision, it's the instability question. <coughs> I mean, precision in itself um, is not enough. The question is, can you modify it by any so small a perturbation, and will the thing still remain stable? Um, and that isn't the case. Oh, yeah. That's <coughs> fine, yeah. Just on that, by the way, can I just say, isn't the third part of Einstein's blunder in a way that the solution was also unstable. <laughs> that, that almost never gets mentioned, but it's also a mathematical blunder as well as everything else, if I understand right, isn't that right? Sure, I mean, uh, Einstein is, is exactly got the same problem. Yeah. I mean, that was the point of Bianchi and Ravella's paper. In a way, Newton was the, the one who better appreciated um, how unphysical it is, actually, to suppose that on physical principles, one could have a stable universe. I'd very much like to believe that Newton got all this, and the system of the world quote is very suggestive, but it, I mean, if I, if I think how the scolium goes, it seems rather difficult to reconcile that I mean, Newton's making such a fuss about um, <coughs> distinguishing between absolute and you know, real, you know, real motions and apparent motions and absolute and relative motions. I mean, just as a matter of sort of Newton exegesis, how do you square that? Um, yeah. Um, well, there's a couple of points to make. I mean, one is whatever the problem the scolium poses for my reading of Principia, it poses the same problem for the reading in Principia in terms of Galilean space-time. So if it's right to say that Galilean space-time structure is what is implicit in Principia, there's, there's a problem with the scolium. Uh, I'm saying it's not Galilean space-time, it's something weaker. I have the same problem with the scolium. Um, but as for why did Newton write that scolium, and is, is that consistent with actually Newton, as it were, correctly understanding both that he could not deliver on absolute velocities, nor that he could deliver on absolute accelerations. Um, 
I do have, I do have uh, something to say about that. I mean, it seems to me that um, Newton um, was making a case for mathematical structures um, which he thought were essential in order to f formulate a clear conception of a mechanical system. And he reified them, you know. <laughs> it wasn't just mathematics. He said there really is this thing called absolute space. Um, and I think that was the error. Uh, but I think that a lot of the arguments that one sees in the scolium as for why one's got to distinguish between merely apparent, measurable spaces and times as opposed to true spaces and times um, c can be understood as arguments in favor of putting in place some mathematical machinery. Um, and they're quite good arguments. <coughs> So there's a read. So there's a reading of um, of Newton, where, which just says the Principia implies Newtonian space-time anti-blundered. And there's a reading of Newton that you're suggesting, which takes it all the way to a Newton-Huygens space-time. But you're, but there's not a stable intermediate position where you'd read Newton as tacitly arguing for Galilean space-time. I, I think it's I think it's very hard to say of Newton that he didn't get it. I mean he. He certainly had corollary six in a very prominent place, and he used it to important effect. Um, most commentators on Newton have not said much about corollary six, and Julian Barber is a notable example. Um, uh, but he used it, and it was very critical. It played a critical role, especially in book one, in deriving certain theorems. He didn't actually have to refer to corollary six again in book two or book three, because he had to. Re he just referred to the theorems where corollary six was used in book one. So it was. It was. It. It wended its way through Principia. Um, for Newton not to appreciate that it would apply just as much to the solar system with respect to other gravitating bodies as it does within the solar system, I think, would be very strange. So did he fail to get the point about really the, the, the paradox? The Ob it's the same as Obel's paradox. The further out you go, yes, the effect fall off as one upon R squared, but the numbers of sources builds up as R squared. Did he fail to get that, perhaps? And, and if so, what a blunder. An isolated one. Uh. Okay, very quickly, Gary, and then we'll break the topic. You mentioned that towards the end of your uh, lecture that you could determine a non rotating frame either by using a pendulum in the laboratory or use um, the motion of the so called fixed stars. No, no, not by using the motion of the fixed stars. Oh, I'm sorry, I must have misheard. No, no, you. gyroscopes. Gy gyroscopes in order, orbit around the Earth would do just fine. I see, a purely local yeah. measurement. Yeah. Yes. Well, Any, anything sufficiently small, screened off from non-gravitational forces, sufficiently small with respect to gravitating bodies in their vicinity, such that the gravitational force is uniform over their dimensions. And then you can control just for, I mean, well, then that will ipso facto be a non-rotating frame. I mean, of course, it, if you said it's spinning, it'll have constant <laughs> Right. <laughs> I, I was going to ask, but maybe it's misplaced. Uh, it's also the case that you can determine a frame from the fixed stars. And of course, famously, the, the puzzle is that these two coincide to high accuracy. I'm wondering if your thoughts or considerations throw light on that coincidence. But, but the, with, with, first of all, um, the fixed stars forming, defining a non-rotating frame, you mean? Mm. Yeah, but there's no, uh, d there's no dynamical model that tells us that. Well, it's certainly a consequence of various dynamical models. Invested. Well, for example, if we're talking about the fixed stars that we actually see, they do not define a non-rotating frame. They're rotating with the, with the rotation of the galaxy. Well, I was thinking more cosmologically. I mean, our current best celestial reference frame consists of a few hundred quasars determined by um, right. radio observation standard right. rest frame which all astronomers have adopted. Right. And it isn't immediately obvious that that rest frame should coincide with your gyroscopic measurements. Uh, abs absolutely. Right. Okay, I suggest we take this to the coffee break at this point, otherwise we're not going to have time. So yeah. let us thank okay. our speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.